Bayer Leverkusen currently looks set to bring down one of the most dominant dynasties in the history of European football. Following 11 straight Bundesliga titles, Bayern Munich currently trail Leverkusen by a whopping 13 points, with only 7 games remaining this season. The title, therefore, ought to be wrapped up, and theoretically, it could be within the next two weeks. But even in a position of such comfort, and even though Xabi Alonso's men haven't lost a single game in any competition this season, putting them in contention to become the first club in history to win a continental treble while going entirely unbeaten, Leverkusen fans won't be taking anything for granted. That's because Leverkusen has a history of, well, how shall I put it? Bottling it. I suppose falling at the final hurdle might be a kinder way of phrasing it, but there's no escaping the reality of the club's past. You don't get a nickname like Visakusen, literally second cousin in English, or Neverkusen, which requires no translation, without having had some catastrophic nearly moments over the years. Despite finishing as Bundesliga runners-up on five separate occasions, Leverkusen have never been crowned as German champions before, no other club has more than two runners-up medals, without tasting glory at least once. Despite reaching four DFB Pokal finals, Leverkusen have only ever won one, and they lost in their only ever DFL Super Cup and UEFA Champions League final appearances. In the words of Jose Mourinho, therefore, Leverkusen are specialists in failure. You know, he is a specialist in failure. Leverkusen are far from being alone, though. In England, Tottenham have gained such a reputation for blowing up when it matters most that they have coined a new term, Spursy, in Colombia. America de Cali's four failed Copa Libertadores final appearances has led to some people claiming that the club is actually cursed, and of course, on the international stage, the Netherlands have reached three World Cup finals and a further two semi-finals without ever managing to win the biggest prize in the sport. Today's video is all about clubs who managed to clutch defeat from the jaws of victory in the most spectacular fashion imaginable. Cases like Manchester United in the 2001-02 season, when they fell to third in the final weeks of the season, having led the table for months, lost 2-1 against Liverpool in the Charity Shield, and were knocked out by our old friends Bayer Leverkusen in the semi-finals of the Champions League. Going from a plausible treble to winning nothing in the blink of an eye, my own club, Hull City, in the 2019-20 season, when we went from sitting pretty, just two points outside of the playoff places at the beginning of January, to finishing dead last in the table, after selling Jared Bowen and Kamil Grosicki in the January transfer window, winning only one more game all season, or, dare I say it, Arsenal last season, when they squandered a five-point lead over Manchester City, with a game in hand no less, having led the Premier League table virtually all season. Well, all of those collapses pale in comparison to what is about to come, so without further ado, whose entire career, ironically, showed such great promise before crumbling into pieces, here are seven of the most promising football seasons, which ended in disaster. Seven. Flamengo, 2023. One of Brazil's famed Big 12 or G12, Flamengo are arguably the biggest football club in Brazil, and therefore among the biggest in the world. Their average attendance of just shy of 60,000 is the highest in the Campeonato Brasileiro. Their overall fan base, totaling more than 45 million people, is the largest in all of Brazil, and they have won a record-breaking 37 Campeonato Carioca titles, which is Rio de Janeiro State Championship, three Copa Libertadores crowns, which is the joint most of any Brazilian club, and only Palmeiras have won the Campeonato Brasileiro more times than them. There can be no doubting Flamengo's historic pedigree or standing then, but in the 2023 season, they showed all the winning mentality of a person wearing an Udinese, a Newcastle United half-and-half -half scarf. Honestly, I am a Hull City fan, I don't know what gives me the idea that I've got any right whatsoever to mock anyone else for their lack of success. Flamengo's 2023 season, which is of course last season in the Brazilian football calendar, was the living embodiment of the phrase close but no cigar. In the Campeonato Brasileiro, Flamengo finished fourth, four points off the title, having lost two of their last three games against bottom half Sao Paulo and their great rivals Atletico Mineiro. Had they won both of those games, they would have won the league. But that is just the start of it. 
In the two-legged final of the Campeonato Carioca, Rio State Championship, Flamengo won 2-0 against Fluminense in the first leg, who also had a player sent off, before falling to a 4-1 defeat in the second leg, which saw them lose 4-3 on aggregate. In the Copa do Brasil, Flamengo also made it through to the final, where they lost 2-1 over two legs, this time against bottom half Sao Paulo. In the Libertadores, Flamengo were 2-0 up against Olympia of Paraguay on aggregate at one stage during the round of 16, but still somehow managed to lose 3-2 on aggregate. In the Brazilian Super Cup, Flamengo twice led before falling to a 4-3 defeat against Palmeiras. In the FIFA Club World Cup, Flamengo lost 3-2 against Al Hilal in the semi-finals. And last but not least, in the Recopa Sudamericana, Flamengo drew one all with Independiente del Val from Ecuador over two legs, before losing 5-4 on aggregate. For those of you who lost count, and who could blame you, that is four finals that Flamengo lost in a single season, plus a semi-final and a round of 16 tie, in which they led 2-0, as well as missing out on the league title by four points, having lost two of their last three games. Flamengo came within inches, therefore, of winning at least five trophies, the all-too-rare quintuple, but ended up with absolutely nothing, during a chaotic season which saw the club burn through four different managers. Absolutely wild, and a perfectly mad season to get us started. Sixth, Manchester United, 1971-72. Manchester United might be the most decorated club in English football, taking all trophies into account, big or small. No, not that small. But that doesn't mean that they are immune from historic collapses. I mentioned the 2001-02 season in the introduction, when a treble or at least a double rapidly turned to dust. Meanwhile, the 1963-64 season saw the Red Devils lose one final, one semi-final, one quarter-final, and miss out on the first division title by four points to Liverpool after losing two of their last five games. And in the 1994-95 season, though it's not often mentioned as being a bottle job or historic cock-up, Manchester United only won five of their last ten games, allowing Blackburn Rovers to snatch the title from their grasp by a solitary point, and they also lost the FA Cup final that season, 1-0 against Everton. None of those seasons can come close to the total and utter collapse that Manchester United suffered in the 1971-72 season though. Despite playing their first two games of the season at Anfield and at Stoke's Victoria ground, due to being banned from Old Trafford after their fans threw knives at opposition supporters at the end of the previous season, Manchester United began life after Sir Matt Busby like a house on fire. By the start of December, Franco Farrell's side already enjoyed a five-point lead at the top of the table and looked good value to win a first First Division title in five years. Having only lost two of their opening 23 games of the season up to New Year though, Manchester United lost seven games in a row at the start of 1972. Of their remaining 19 games as a whole, the Red Devils only won five of them, falling not just from top spot, but all the way down to eighth, which meant no European football the following season. To add insult to injury, United were knocked out of both the FA Cup and the League Cup by Stoke City, who finished 17th that season. This was to be, effectively, George Best's last season in which he was fully engaged with the sport, even though he was only aged 25, and it is often cited as being a reason for his disillusionment with the sport that followed. Two years later, Man United were relegated for the first time since World War II. Fifth, Newcastle United, 1995-96. One of the most iconic fumbles in Premier League history, the 1995-96 season looked like it was finally going to be the one for Newcastle United. Following promotion in 1993, the Magpies had finished 3rd and 6th in the previous two seasons under Kevin Keegan, but they looked a much more confident and assured outfit in 95-96, inspired by new arrivals like David Ginola and Les Ferdinand. Newcastle made a remarkable start to the campaign, winning 9 out of their first 10 games, and by Christmas, having still only lost 2 games all season, Keegan's entertainers had opened up a 10-point lead on 2nd place Manchester United, with a goal difference that was also superior by a margin of 10. A 2-0 defeat at Old Trafford exposed a previously unidentified fragility to Newcastle, but even then, 5 wins on the bounce restored a 9-point gap with a game in hand. 
From that point on, it ought to have been practically impossible for Newcastle not to win a first top flight league title in almost 70 years. Where there is a will, there is a way, however, as the Toon won just two of their next eight matches, relinquishing top spot, which they had occupied for literally every single one of the first 29 weeks of the season. A 1-0 win away at Leeds took Newcastle back to within three points of Man United, with a game in hand, but it was following that win that Kevin Keegan gave a now infamous interview with old hairy hands Richard Keyes and Andy Gray. I'll tell you, honestly, I will love it if we beat them. Love it. Yeah, they didn't beat them. Newcastle failed to win either of their last two games against Nottingham Forest and Tottenham. Meanwhile, Manchester United thrashed Forest 5-0 and beat Middlesbrough 3-0 in their last two fixtures to make amends for their own fumble the previous term. Almost 30 years on now, Newcastle still haven't won a top flight league title since 1927 or a major trophy of any description since 1955, the same year that diamond bearing deposits were discovered by Soviet geologists in the town of Myrny in Siberia. Fourth, Benfica, 2012-13. In fairness to Benfica, if you look at their 2012-13 Portuguese Premier League results out of context, played 30, won 24, drew 5 and lost only 1, it's hard to say that they did a fat deal wrong. And they didn't, but this is still one of the all-time great promising seasons that ended in disaster. You see... Following successive runners-up medals in the Premier League over the previous two seasons, Benfica led the division for almost the entirety of the 2012-13 season. This was, it should be said, firmly a two-horse race, as Sporting finished seventh in their worst ever Premier League campaign. With just three games of the season to go, although Benfica and Porto remained unbeaten, Benfica enjoyed a four-point lead. Given the fact that they had only dropped 8 points all season, after 27 games, that ought to have been the title wrapped up. Benfica began the run-in by drawing one all with Estoril though, while Porto won away at Nacional, narrowing the gap to just 2 points. In the penultimate game of the season, the two title challengers met one another at the Estadio de Drago. Their first meeting of the season had ended in a 2-all draw, and after 90 minutes, the score was tied up one all in Porto. If Benfica hung on, they would only need to win against relegated Morarense in the final game of the season to win the title. In the last minute, however, Brazilian wideman Kelvin, who was a Porto flop by all accounts, popped up with by far the most important goal that he would ever score. For the first time since February, Porto leapfrogged Benfica into top spot, claiming their seventh Premier League title in only eight years. The pain didn't stop there for Benfica though, who lost on penalties against Braga in the semi-finals of the Taça da Liga, then just days after missing out on the title, in the cruelest circumstances imaginable, they conceded a 93rd minute winner against Chelsea in the final of the Europa League, and just a week after that, they surrendered a 1-0 lead to lose 2-1 against Vitória de Guimarães in the final of the Taça de Portugal, conceding two goals in two minutes. Benfica came within one point and two finals of winning a treble, but two injury time winners and a two-minute two-goal salvo turned what looked like being one of the club's greatest ever seasons into one of their most painful in the blink of an eye. Third, Real Madrid, 2003-04. Ah, the Galacticos. An era, instigated by club president Florentino Perez, in which Real Madrid signed at least one of the best players in the world every single season. The end result, which really culminated in the 2003-04 season, was a squad which contained the likes of Luis Figo, Zinedine Zidane, David Beckham, Raul Ronaldo, Roberto Carlos and Iker Casillas. On paper, it was the best team in the world, and it looked like it for much of the 2003-04 season. Madrid only lost three of their first 28 La Liga games, opening up, by the beginning of March, a seemingly unassailable lead at the top of the table, eight points clear of Valencia in second, and a massive 13 points clear of Barcelona in fourth. In the cup competitions, likewise, Madrid breezed past Valencia and Sevilla en route to the final of the Copa del Rey, in addition to going undefeated in the group stage of the Champions League, before beating Bayern Munich in the round of 16. The treble was very much on then, but in the last two months of the season, Los Blancos collapsed. And when I say collapsed, 
We are talking the New York Stock Exchange circa 1929, Type 2 supernovae, and global ecosystems and biodiversity in recent years' style collapse. Having collected an average of 2.3 points per game throughout their first 26 games of the season, Madrid averaged just 0.9 points per game over their last 12 games of the campaign. Across those 12 games, Carlos Quiroz's side collected just three wins. Madrid lost six out of their last seven league games, including all of their last five, against the likes of Osasuna, Mallorca and Murcia. This was a team, I'll just remind you, which contained Beckham, Figo, Raul, Ronaldo and Zidane. From an eight-point lead over Valencia at the top of the table and 13 over Barcelona, Los Blancos finished the season in fourth place behind both Valencia and Barca, missing out on even automatic qualification for the Champions League group stage. That collapse alone would probably earn Madrid a spot in this seven, but the fact that their collapse wasn't just restricted to La Liga propels them up into third. Madrid lost 3-2 against Real Zaragoza in the final of the Copa del Rey, in a defeat that was made all the more painful, not just because Zaragoza's winner came in the 111th minute, but also because the final was held in Barcelona. In the Champions League, despite winning the first leg of their quarterfinal tie against Monaco 4-2, Madrid lost the second leg 3-1 and were eliminated by virtue of away goals. In short, a guaranteed title and a potential treble for what was then the most high-profile and most expensively assembled football team on the planet turned into a fourth-place finish and no major trophies within a matter of weeks, due to a run of form that you would expect of Sheffield United this season rather than the Galacticos. Why they get big one? Incidentally, Monaco, who came from 5-2 behind at one stage to beat Real Madrid in the Champions League that season, had a bit of a promising season turned to disaster all of their own. Having led the league on table almost all season, a wretched run saw them slip to third, meanwhile they lost against Porto in the final of the Champions League and lower league Chateau in the Coupe de France. Second, Bayer Leverkusen, 2001-02. Mentioned briefly in the introduction, Bayer Leverkusen looks certain to claim a first ever Bundesliga title this season and could potentially pull off one of the game's great invincible campaigns across three different competitions. However, we have been here before. In fact, in the 2001-02 season, under Klaus Topmola, Leverkusen were chasing an even more prestigious treble, the holy grail of German football if you like, the Bundesliga, the DFB Pokal, and the UEFA Champions League. With three league games to go, Leverkusen had what looked to be a comfortable lead at the top of the Bundesliga table, five points clear of Borussia Dortmund in second, and seven ahead of reigning champions, Bayern Munich in third. Not only that, they had two cup finals on the horizon, a DFB Pokal final against Schalke and a UEFA Champions League final against Real Madrid, having already knocked Arsenal, Juventus, Liverpool and Manchester United out of Europe. The first wobble came away at bottom half Hamburg, where Leverkusen drew one all, but the wheels really started to fall off the following week against Werder Bremen. A 2-1 defeat, whilst their two title rivals both won, narrowed the gap to just two and four points. Next up, in the penultimate game of the season, a trip to Bayern's rivals Nuremberg, who were fighting relegation. Nuremberg did their old rivals a favour, inflicting Leverkusen with their second successive defeat, although it was Dortmund who capitalised to claim top spot. When it no longer mattered, Leverkusen rediscovered their form on the final day of the season against Schalke, but victory for Dortmund, who came back from 1-0 down to beat Werder Bremen 2-1, saw them miss out on the title by a solitary point. A week later, Leverkusen faced Schalke once again and this time it would matter, as the two teams met in the DFB Pokal final. Inevitably, therefore, Leverkusen very publicly soiled themselves, losing the game 4-2 despite having taken a 1-0 lead. They would be afforded just four days of preparation from successive heartbreaks before facing Real Madrid in the final of the UEFA Champions League. This was, in some ways, a battle between a club that is synonymous with winning and finding a way to win by any means necessary, and a club that is synonymous with losing and finding a way to lose by any means necessary. Again, inevitably then, loses what Leverkusen did. 
Off the back of a 3-0 defeat against Deportivo La Coruña, Real Madrid beat Bayer Leverkusen 2-1 at Hampden Park, a stunning volley by Zinedine Zidane, enough to claim their first European conquest in a whole two years. For Leverkusen, it was six games over four weeks, which could have seen them win the treble. The double was theirs to lose, and the league title at least ought to have been in the bag. Truly historic levels of bottling. First, Botafogo, 2023. I know what you're thinking. What could possibly be worse than having a treble in the palm of your hand and ending up with nothing? Well, let me tell you. Extraordinarily, in the second 2023 Campeonato Brasileiro inclusion in this seven, which is pretty wild when you think about it, no one, and I mean no one, has ever dropped the bag quite as spectacularly as Botafogo in the 2023 season. Simply put, in the first half of the 2023 campaign, Botafogo set a Campeonato Brasileiro points record. The club from Rio took 47 from a possible 57 points at the midway point in the season, equaling Corinthians' record from the 2017 season. That put Botafogo a truly gargantuan 13 points clear at the top of the table. Even after 21 games, having picked up a couple of draws, Botafogo was still 11 points clear with only 17 games to go. In order to win the title, Botafogo only needed to win 20 points from those remaining 17 games. In other words, having averaged over 2.4 points per game for over half the season, they only needed to average less than 1.2 points per game for the remainder of the campaign to win the league. A mere seven wins would have done the job. The departure of manager Luis Castro to join Al Nasser in the Saudi Pro League in June clearly can't have helped, but it would be another couple of months before Botafogo's form really fell off a cliff. In came former Wolves boss Bruno Larg, who was sacked after taking Botafogo on an eight-game winless run. His replacement, Lucio Flavio, wouldn't win a single game following his appointment. In total, Botafogo won just two of their last 17 games, losing eight of them, and of course, drawing the rest. They went, therefore, from winning 51 points out of a possible 63 in their first 21 games, to winning just 13 points out of a possible 51 in their last 17. The end result was that massive 13-plus point gap getting swallowed up by not one, not two, not even three, but four different clubs, as Botafogo sank from seemingly certain title winners to finishing all the way down in fifth and failing to even automatically qualify for the Libertadores group stage. To add insult to injury, Botafogo also went out in the round of 16 of the Copa do Brasil, and in the quarterfinals of the Copa Sudamericana, turning what looked like being one of the most dominant seasons in the modern history of Brazilian football, into the most bizarre and humiliating collapse in the history of football worldwide. What is particularly odd about Botafogo's 2023 collapse is that, despite their results, they continued to play quite well and impress in a lot of their games. They actually dominated matches against Palmeiras and Gremio, leading 3-1 at one stage, but going on to lose 4-3 in both, they conceded a 95th minute equaliser against Red Bull Bragantino, an 89th minute equaliser against relegated Santos, and a 98th, yes, I said 98th minute equaliser against Cortiva. There has perhaps never been a more worthy top spot in the history of this channel, albeit it is an unwanted one. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. I obviously hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts and any seasons that you feel should have featured down below in the comments. I'm sure that I have missed some weird and wonderful ones going back in time, so I'd be interested to know. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying, make sure that you're subscribed and have notifications turned on, not just for this channel, HITC7s, but also my second channel, Alfie Potts Harmer, both of which should be about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might enjoy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.